Stavrogin's destination was a house at the very edge of town in a deserted alley between fenced-off vegetable gardens. It was a small wooden house, obviously newly built and not yet weatherboarded. The shutters on one of its windows had been deliberately left open, and there was a lighted candle on the window ledge, evidently intended as a signal for the nighttime visitor they expected. When he was still about 30 yards away, Stavrogin discovered the tall figure of a man standing at the door of the house. Unable to wait, he must have come out to see whether anyone was coming down the road. Then Stavrogin heard his impatient, but at the same time fearful voice. Is that you? Is that you, sir? Yes, Stavrogin answered, but not until he had reached the door and was closing his umbrella. At last, Lavyekin said, beginning to fuss. May I take your umbrella? It's so wet outside. I'll open it here in the corner. Please, come in, please. The door, standing wide open, led from the passage into a room that was lighted by two candles. If I hadn't had your word that you were coming, I would have given up hope. It's a quarter to one, Stavrogin said, glancing at his watch as he entered the room. But this rain, and it's a considerable distance, and I have no watch, and all I can see from the windows is the vegetable gardens. So I was bound to get out of touch with what's going on in town. But, of course, I'm not complaining. I would never dare. I only mention it because I've been tortured all week by impatience to find out at last what? To decide what will become of me, sir. Please come in. He bowed low, indicating a chair by the table that stood in front of the sofa. Stavrogin looked around. The room was very small and its ceiling was low. It was furnished with the bare essentials only. Wooden chairs and a long wooden settee also, completely new and without either cover or cushions. Two limewood tables, one by the sofa, the other in a corner, covered with a tablecloth and set with a number of dishes with a clean napkin spread over them. The whole room seemed spotlessly clean. Labyekin had not been drunk for eight whole days, and his face looked bloated and yellowish. He seemed ill at ease and worried, but at the same time curious. He obviously didn't know what tone he should use to address Stavrogin, or what behavior would be most advantageous. Here, as you can see, I live like the holy man Zosima. Abstinence, solitude, and poverty. The vow of a medieval knight. What makes you think that medieval knights made such vows? Perhaps I've got it all wrong. I never received a proper education. Alas, but you know, Miss, Mr. Stavrogin, here I've mastered my shameful weakness for the first time. I haven't had a drink all this time, not a single drop. I feel I have my little corner, though, and for six days I've been experiencing the blessing of a, cure, of a clear conscience. Even the walls here smell of resin and remind me of Mother Nature. And what was I before? Homeless at night, the liquor I'd soak. Next day, tongue hanging with thirst, I'd choke, as that poet of genius so strikingly expressed it. But you're soaked to the skin. Wouldn't you like some tea? Please don't bother. The samovar has been boiling since seven o'clock. But I'm afraid it's gone out now, or like everything in this world. They say even the sun will go out, too, when the time comes. But if you wish, I'll get it going again. Agafia is still awake. Tell me, is Maria? She's here, right here. Labiakin whispered hurriedly. Would you like to see her? He pointed to the closed door leading to the adjoining room. Isn't she asleep? Oh no, how could she be? She's been waiting for you all evening. As soon as she knew you were coming, she began making herself beautiful for you. Labiakin's face twisted slightly into a knowing, facetious smirk, but he hurriedly wiped it off. How is she, generally? Stavrogin asked, frowning. Generally? Well, you know how it is yourself, Lebetkin said with a regretful shrug. Just now she's telling her fortune with the cards. All right, I'll see her later. First, I want to settle with you, Stavrogin said, sitting down in a chair. Lebetkin didn't dare sit down on the sofa. He hurriedly pulled up another chair and leaned forward, trembling and full of awe, ready to listen to what Stavrogin had to say. What have you got under the napkin there? Stavrogin asked, indicating the table in the corner. That? Lebyekin said, turning his head in that direction and sniggering ingratiatingly. That's also part of your generosity. Generosity. 
our housewarming, so to speak. And also, with due regard to the distance you've had to walk to get here and the fact that you must naturally be tired, he got up, reverently tiptoed over to the table, and carefully pulled off the napkin. Under it, there was a complete cold supper. Ham, veal, sardines, cheese, a small green decanter, and a bottle of Bordeaux. Everything was laid out neatly, expertly, almost elegantly. Is this your effort? Yes, sir. Since yesterday, I've been doing my best so we could receive you decently. You know yourself that Maria isn't very concerned about that sort of thing, but as I said, it is above all the result of your generosity. It's all yours because you are the real master of this house, and I'm only, so to speak, in your employ, although I'm still a free man in spirit. Please leave me that last possession, sir, he concluded self-pityingly. Hmm. I wish you'd sit down again. Thank you, thank you, sir. I can be both grateful and independent at the same time, you know. Ah, oh, Mr. Stavrogin, there's so much pent up in this heart of mine that I could hardly wait for your arrival. Now you're going to settle my life and the life of this poor creature, and then, then I shall open my heart to you just as I used to do in the old days four years ago. Why, you were kind enough to listen to me then and even to read my poems. I didn't mind their calling me your false deaf because you played such an important part in my life. But now I'm in a state of dreadful apprehension, and you are my only hope for guidance and advice. Peter Verkovinsky is treating me quite unspeakably. Stavrogin observed him intently and listened to him with great curiosity. Although he'd stopped drinking, Lebyakin still didn't seem to be quite sober mentally. Habitual drunkards often tend to become permanently incoherent, dazed as it were although they can still lie, cheat, and deceive as well as the next man when they feel it's necessary. I see you haven't changed at all in these four years, Captain, Stavrogin said in a slightly friendlier tone. You seem to confirm the idea that the second part of a man's life consists of following the habits acquired during the first half. Those are words of great wisdom. You've solved the riddle of life, Lebyekin exclaimed, half theatrically, half sincerely, because he was a great lover of phrases. Of all the things you've said, Mr. Stavrogin, what's mostly deeply engraved in my memory is what you uttered in Petersburg. Quote, it takes a great man to resist common sense. I think that's really great. Or a fool. All right, so a fool can do it too. But what I was trying to say was that all your life you've been, you've been coining those witty sayings while they, I would like to see Peter Verkovinsky or Laputin come out with anything like that, even once. Ah, uh, Peter Verkovinsky has been so nasty to me. But then you, Captain, haven't behaved so wonderfully either, I understand. It's my drunkenness, and on top of that, the host of enemy enemies I have. But now that's all past, and I will regenerate myself like the serpent. Do you know, Mr. Stavrogin, that I'm working on my will now? In fact, I've already drafted it. That's interesting. What are you leaving, and who will get what? Our mother country, mankind, and the brotherhood of students. You know, I read in the newspaper about the life of an American. He left his huge fortune to build factories and to the real sciences, his skeleton to the students or to their academy over there, and his skin for a drum with a clause stating that the American national anthem should be beaten on it once a day and once at night. Alas, we Russians are but pygmies incapable of the flights of Americans' imagination. Russia is a freak of nature and not a product of the intellect. If I attempted to leave my skin to make a drum for, say, the Akmalinsk Regiment, in which I had the honor to serve, on condition that they beat the Russian national anthem on it daily, I'd be accused of liberalism, and my skin would be banned. So I'll content myself with the students. I do want to leave my skeleton to the, the Academy of Sciences, though. But with the proviso that they stick a label on my skull with the words, a repentant free thinker. So there. Lebyatkin spoke heatedly, and there was no doubt that he sincerely admired the elegance of the American's will. He was also anxious to make Stavrogin, to whom he had at one time been a jester, laugh. But Stavrogin didn't even smile. On the contrary, he asked quite suspiciously, So you intend to make your will public while you're still living and receive money in advance? Well, if I did, sir, what's wrong with that? 
Levyakin said, closely watching Stavrogin's reactions. Think what sort of a life I have. I've even stopped writing poems now, and you'll remember there was a time when they amused even you. Remember sitting before a nice bottle of something? But I've written my last. Like Gogol wrote his last story, the one you remember, in which he announced to all Russia that it had poured out of his breast in a song. Well, I'm through too, and that's all there is to it. And what's this last poem of yours? It's called, If She Should Break a Leg. What? That was just what the captain had been waiting for. He loved his own poems, relishing them more than anything else in the world. But at the same time, being a confirmed ham, he also immensely enjoyed the fact that Stavrogin always laughed at his efforts. In fact, at times, he almost rolled around, holding his sides with laughter. Thus, Labiat can achieve two objectives at once. Poetic satisfaction for himself, an amusement for his master, but now he had another special and very delicate objective in mind. By reciting his poetry, the captain was trying to justify himself on a point about which he was particularly worried and somehow felt very guilty. If she should break a leg, I mean in a riding accident. It's just a fantasy, Mr. Stavrogin. Raving, but the raving of a poet. Once when I met a lady on horseback, I was quite struck by her and asked myself the following materialistic question. What would happen? That's in case, you know. The answer's obvious. All her admirers would scuttle off. All her suitors would make themselves scarce. Was his das? Goodbye, my lass. The poet alone would remain faithful. His heart shattered within his breast. Mr. Stavrogin, remember, even a louse can fall in love. The laws of nature do not bar even it from love. But for some reason, the writing lady took offense at the letter and at the poem. I've heard that even you were angry. Is that correct? I was so sad about it. I refused to believe it. After all, whom could I possibly hurt just by dreaming things up? Moreover, I swear that Laputin kept egging me on. Go on, send it, he kept telling me. Every man has the right to free correspondence. Well, so I sent it. I understand you offered her your hand. It's all the work of my enemies. Recite the poem, Stavrogin interrupted him sternly. It was raving, nothing but raving. Nevertheless, Lebyekin stood up straight and began. The beauty of beauties, a limb has broken. Always a charmer, now two times more. And he whose love was already bespoken now loves her twice as much as before. That'll do, Stavrogin said, stopping him with a wave of the hand. I dream of Petersburg. I dream of regeneration, Lebyatkin said, as if there had never been even, even any mention of a poem. You're my benefactor, and I would like to know whether I may hope to be provided with money to make a trip. I've been waiting for you all this week like someone waiting for the sun. Uh, well, I hope you'll excuse me. I'm rather short now, and then I really see no reason why I should give you money. Stavrogin seemed to have grown suddenly angry. In a cutting tone, he briefly enumerated all of Lavyakin's misdeeds. Drunkenness, lying, spending the money destined for his sister, threatening to reveal the truth, insolently accusing Dasha, and so on. The captain cringed, made gestures of protest, even tried to answer the charges, but each time Stavrogin stopped him peremptorily. 